Welcome to Season 5 of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and a former health commissioner here in Baltimore, Maryland. Our goal with this podcast is to bring scientific evidence and experience to shed light on critical health issues. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Hi, I'm Lindsay Smith-Rogers, producer of Public Health on Call. Today is World Malaria Day, and Stephanie Desmond talks to George Demopoulos from the Johns Hopkins Malaria Research Institute about his work aimed at preventing illness in mosquitoes instead of humans. They discuss how genetically engineered mosquitoes that can't carry the malaria parasite could be a game changer in preventing malaria, which kills 400,000 people a year. Let's listen. George Demopoulos, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you. So today I wanted to talk to you about uh, malaria and genetically modified mosquitoes. But what I'd really like to start with is if you could sort of remind our listeners of the scope of the problem of malaria uh, and how we've gotten to where we are today. Absolutely. Um, Malaria is a disease Uh, that is caused by a pathogen called plasmodium. And it is transmitted between humans through mosquitoes. So when a hungry female mosquito uh, has to feed on blood from a human who is malaria infected, when it uh, acquires that blood meal, as we call it, it will also become infected with a malaria parasite. And that parasite will then... um, infect the mosquito and develop in the mosquito and that development into an infectious stage will take about two weeks. And at that time, the mosquito may want to feed again on blood. And when it feeds on another human, it will pass on that infectious stage of the parasite onto that new human. So that is how malaria is uh, transmitted in nature. And malaria is not a new disease. It has been with us for a very, very long time. Um, The first descriptions of malaria are found in ancient Chinese medical records from 2700 BC. And then there are numerous other records uh, from the uh, ancient Greeks, the Chinese, and later on in the second century and 16th century, Um, Actually, already in the 16th century, the Spanish uh, started to use some um, um, bark of trees to treat malaria. And uh, a French chemist identified the first uh, drug for malaria in 1820 and so on. And and we started to uh, um, use chemicals to control malaria almost 100 years ago. So this disease has been with us for a very long time. And despite that, uh, we still have malaria and it's a serious problem. Uh, There are about 228 million cases uh, yearly. 90% of those cases occur in Africa and 400,000 people die approximately each year. Uh, and again, 90% in Africa. Half of the world's population is at risk from malaria because of the prevalence of mosquitoes uh, in those areas. And major challenges to control malaria is the ability of the parasite to develop resistance against the drugs. There are several malaria drugs that we can take, but the parasite is very good at developing resistance. And the mosquito is very good at developing resistance to insecticides. Because one of the most important methods for controlling malaria is uh, the spraying of insecticides to kill mosquitoes. But the mosquitoes can develop resistance to these insecticides. And uh, there is also use of bed nets and other strategies to control malaria. And all these current and past strategies, um, they also require a continuous effort that is very costly and logistically complicated. 
spraying, uh, taking drugs, uh, removing mosquito breeding sites, using bed nets, etc. It requires a continuous effort and compliance of uh, people who live in malaria endemic areas. So your lab is trying to, a different tack, you're trying to uh, genetically modify the mosquitoes so that they no longer can get the parasite. Is that right? Yes, that's right. So we are focusing on curing the mosquito rather than curing uh, the human. Um, because we know that the parasite has to um, go through a quite complicated life cycle in the mosquito in order to become transmitted to a human host. So there are many different ways by which we can interfere with that life cycle of the mosquito, uh, of the parasite in the mosquito, and, and uh, block it, basically. The mosquito has an immune system like us. It's simpler, it's more primitive, it's called an innate immune system. And that immune system is actually fighting the malaria parasite. But in nature, it's not uh, sufficiently effective to kill all the parasites that the mosquito will acquire. So we have found ways to genetically uh, engineer the mosquito's immune system to make it stronger and better at killing the parasite. Now, once you have developed a genetically modified mosquito that cannot transmit the parasite because it kills it, you can spread that engineered gene using um, a technology called gene drive. What gene drive does is it basically enables the spreading of a trait or a gene in a population very efficiently. So the long-term goal of our project is to develop mosquitoes that are resistant to the malaria parasite through genetic engineering of specific genes and then spread these genes or this resistance trait in natural mosquito populations. So eventually, all the mosquitoes would become resistant to the parasite and they would not be able to transmit it. The... Um, main advantage of this strategy, if you can get it to work, is that no one has to do anything um, in terms of uh, effort and compliance in using bed nets, spraying insecticides, or taking drugs. It's also an egalitarian uh, approach. Everyone gets protected, not only those who can afford the drugs or have access to the bed nets. Uh, so, so these uh, are the main advantages of this approach that we think could become a game changer uh, in the fight against malaria. So how far away are we from maybe testing this? Well, uh, testing has already started in the laboratory. We have to do extensive testing of different strains of mosquitoes that have been engineered in different ways to block the parasite because there are many, many parameters that we would have to uh, investigate uh, and look at before you know, we could even consider starting testing in the open field in nature. We have to make sure that these mosquitoes are as fit as the natural mosquitoes so that they can actually compete with them. We have to make sure that the parasite can't develop resistance to this engineered blocking mechanism. Uh, we will have to make sure that these uh, engineering, the engineering that we do to the mosquito does not have any um, negative impact on ecology, uh, the food chain. Uh, it doesn't cause a more severe uh, bite reaction on humans. It, it cannot transmit another pathogen easier. Uh, so there are many things that you know, we have to look at and investigate in the laboratory before we can go out in the field. Uh, I would suspect that, or predict, I would predict that we are about um, maybe four to six years away from you know, field trials. Mm -hmm. There's a reluctance on that end as well. I, I understand that uh, while this all sounds like wonderful science and magic, um, folks out in, in the field are not super excited. Uh, well, some folks in the field are not super excited, not 
not, uh, I wouldn't say that the majority in the field are not super excited. Um, and there is a concern uh, with regards to genetic engineering of organisms in general. And, you know, it might be well-funded in some cases, uh, but in other cases it may not. And um, I think the way we are uh, approaching this problem is uh, to make sure that the engineering of these mosquitoes is not really going to lead to any adverse uh, result or, or unpredictable adverse result at the end. Uh, one good thing with gene drive is that you can also reverse it. If you would see that something went wrong, you can you can release another gene drive mosquito that will sort of cancel out the first one. Um, so uh, so there are mitigation strategies in place, and there will be thorough testing in the field before we can even consider using this technology uh, for malaria control. So it may take many, many years before we can actually roll out and implement this strategy. And some people may find that discouraging, but we have to remember that malaria has been with us for you know, 10,000 years or more. Uh, so, you know, a few years more uh, or less, it doesn't really matter. I think it's more important to come up with a long-term and effective solution to this problem than trying to make shortcuts and looking for the short uh, the quick and short-term solutions. Uh, and we have seen many examples of that uh, in, the, in the area of malaria control. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds very exciting. Um, I know that this has been attempted in the United States for a different kind of mosquito, for other diseases. Um, how has that gone? Well, the technology that has been used in the United States is uh, different from what we are looking at implementing. So uh, when it comes to malaria control, there are two basic technologies that one can use that both use uh, gene drive, um, uh, utilizing genetic engineering of mosquitoes. One technology that we are developing is to render mosquitoes resistant to the parasite and then spread that resistance in the mosquito population. So you're not really killing the mosquitoes. You're not getting rid of the mosquitoes. You're just replacing mosquitoes that can transmit malaria with other mosquitoes that can transmit malaria. So that's the strategy we are working on. The strategy that has been used or tested in the United States um, was performed with an another mosquito species that does not transmit malaria because there's no malaria in the United States, but it transmits arboviruses such as dengue and Zika. And there are uh, those, those uh, infections that do occur in the United States. Um, and in this strategy, uh, these mosquitoes were engineered uh, to be sterile. So uh, what happens here is that uh, very large numbers of mosquitoes are being reared in facilities and they are engineered to be sterile and then they are released in nature and because they're sterile, when they mate with the natural mosquitoes, they don't produce any offspring. They don't produce any, uh, any mosquito kids. So, um, um, so what happens there is that you suppress the population. Uh, you will basically decrease the number of mosquitoes significantly in a certain area. And that technology is powerful. There is probably a lesser concern with the genetic engineering component there because the mutation or the engineered gene does not persist in nature because those mosquitoes die. They don't pass that mutation on to the offspring. Um, but the one problem with that technology is that it's expensive and logistically complicated because you need to release these mosquitoes continuously. Mm. Uh, you need to release them. Uh, in very large numbers. And if you stop releasing for a certain period of time, that area is going to become repopulated with new mosquitoes that will come in from other parts uh, of, of that geographic region, uh, resulting in the resumption of disease transmission. Mm -hmm. George Demopoulos, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Public Health On Call is produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. 
Audio production by Niall Owen McCusker, Matthew Martin, Spencer Greer, and Holly Cardinal, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media support from Grace Holes Fernandez. Thank you for listening.